I'm a researcher, thank you, at the University of Bristol for the next week um, when I finish and in January I'm starting at the University of Liverpool so I'm very soon to be local to here. But yeah, so I, I'm an epidemiologist and a psychologist so I mainly deal with big spreadsheets of ones and zeros and I don't really get to deal with humans, um, which is part of the reason that I started doing kind of science outreach, public engagement, science communication, it has all these words that are sort of slightly meaningless, but um, um, so I started doing this podcast uh, kind of as a way of talking to humans, uh, and I've, um, it was called in the program podcast for advocacy, and you might notice that I've snuck a little question mark in there, so that's something I'd be really interested to hear your opinion on. But um, I just for people who haven't listened to the podcast yet, it's the idea behind it was to try and talk about the science around recreational drugs. And um, when I first started uh, prepping for the first episode, I wrote "No judgment, no spin, no hyperbole" at the top of my bit of paper as kind of a mantra to try and work from. Um, I hope I've achieved that. It's certainly my intention. And for the most part. The podcasts are episodic, so uh, with my co-host, uh, on whom more later, we discuss one substance per episode. We start off with a discussion around what are the appeals of this substance, um, then move on to the sort of the science, so the short-term effects, the longer-term effects, myths that surround the substance, uh, any potential benefits it might have. And then importantly, throughout and at the end, we fo really focus on sort of what we don't know. So I think a lot of talk about drug in the media tends to be very much this is the way it is when actually the science surrounding it is much more shades of grey and sort of there's so much that we don't know about about the short term and the long term effects of various substances. It's been a really, really long time in gestation this podcast. I first uh, sort of came up with the idea when I was taking part in a Wellcome Trust funded event for academics called I'm a Scientist, Get Me Out of Here, uh, which took a group of, um, it was all done online and it takes a group of five academics in any subject and pairs them with eight classes of secondary school children. Um, over two weeks, for the first week they can ask you any question they want online it's, and then you also do live chats, online chats with, with a class uh, of school children. It's really intense, uh, but a lot of fun. And um, so you have a week of this, they can ask you any question, and part of it is to sort of show what scientists are and what they're not. So I'm a psychologist, I don't know how much the moon weighs, for example, but <laughs> scientists are sort of people who focus on one particular area rather than sort of nerds in white coats who know everything about everything. And uh, in the second week, uh, they then the kids then start voting for their favourite scientist uh, once a day, and uh, eventually the winner is given a small amount of money to start a science communication project. And you have to say at the very beginning what you want to do, and I said, well, I want to make podcasts for teenagers about sort of what the science surrounding recreational drugs, I suppose. So um, I did win the, uh, the brain zone was the zone that I was in for this. And... Um, so I bought myself some recording equipment and I recorded a few interviews with scientists, some of whom are in the room today. Uh, thank you. And um, I just couldn't work out how to make it gel and be interesting to teenagers. Um, and I kind of sat on it for a really long time until uh, last summer I was invited onto uh, Scroobius Pip's podcast. Now, Scroobius Pip is a rapper. Um, but he's also started doing a podcast recently where he talks to um, interesting people. So usually it's people like comedians, actors, musicians. Um, he's had a few charities on the podcast as well. Uh, and the reason that I ended up on there was because he tweeted saying, I'm going to be in Bristol. Does anyone know anyone who should be on it? Someone suggested Huey from the Fun Loving Criminals. And someone else suggested me. And Huey was busy. So... <laughs> So he came round to my house and we had a chat and I sort of deliberately mentioned this idea for this podcast while I was talking to him so that it would go out to sort of thousands of people would listen to it and I'd have to do it, sort of make myself do it. But it ended up having a, a, another benefit as well because Pip said, oh, uh, I'm going to start a podcast network, you should put out the podcast on my network. And then he said, oh, and maybe you should think about structuring it so you as the, as the academic talking to an interested but lay friend oh, and I can be that friend if you want. So this person who's already got this huge network that's completely different to my sort of science communication network, agreeing to be on it, obviously I jumped at the chance. And the hope 
with getting someone like him involved is that it takes it away from being a sort of science communication project where it's me talking to the people who always listen to the things that I do. So who always read my blog or who always sort of are engaged with science already and sort of think in a kind of evidence-based way and potentially reaching a whole different audience of people. So um, we're about, I think we're 13 episodes in at the moment. I don't know whether you can see, but these are some of the substances we've talked about. So the first episode was cannabis. We don't discriminate by legality. So we've talked about tobacco and alcohol and caffeine. We've also done uh, new psychoactive substances, ketamine, psychedelics, um, and I've got a few more already recorded. Um, I've also done a special sort of bonus podcast where Pip wasn't involved and I spoke to a couple of people who work for Bristol Drugs Project about sort of what a drugs project is and the kind of work that they do in Bristol. And the reason I started it was because I felt like there was sort of a gap for this kind of information and in this kind of format and I'll talk a bit uh, later on about sort of what I think is p potentially special about giving this information as a podcast rather than sort of writing it down or trying to get it out in, in other kinds of ways. I feel like the sort of the credible information without judgment and without spin is something that's really difficult to do and I don't know whether I have managed it. It's, it's my intention, that's what I'm trying to do, but I'd certainly be really interested to hear your opinion on whether I'm sort of treading that <coughs> line well. And there's still the issue about how to get it to the appropriate audience. Getting someone like Pip involved who doesn't have anything to do with science or academia brings it to a different audience, but I still, I, I don't really know how to monitor whether I'm getting it to the people who I really should be getting it to. So that's another thing that basically, I'm gonna ask you loads of questions. <laughs> and so uh, that's one of the things that I'm really keen to try and work out how to do is how to really <laughs> sort of know what it's being used for. Since it's launched, it launched in uh, May of this year, and the response was completely overwhelming. I sort of wasn't quite ready for it. So a couple of these pictures are screen grabs of the iTunes chart. So when I launched, I launched a trailer before the first episode uh, came out, and that immediately went to the, the top of the science and medicine chart of iTunes. Now, the charts are very much weighted for new podcasts, so it was, it was partly to do with that, but still for a sort of one minute talk about me sort of explaining what the podcast was going to be. That was pretty amazing. And then the first episode proper when it launched actually made it into the top 10 of the entire iTunes chart. It was ahead of Serial. It was like the best day of my life. So exciting. <laughs> um, and as I said, it's part of uh, a podcast network. And um, so Scroobius Pip's Distraction Pieces podcast, which is sort of the figurehead, it's got hundreds of episodes and a really, really big listenership is obviously the thing that's leading. We've had seven million downloads as a, as a network and I'm willing to bet that at least six million of those are pips. But <laughs> we're getting there. And um, the other podcasts on the network are sort of, well, one in particular is slightly related. So Leap UK, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, have got a podcast that they've just started called Stop and Search. And that being part of this network, but a separate podcast has been extremely helpful for me in terms of really keeping me on the issues of the science surrounding the drugs and knowing that if people want information about sort of legality and, and policy and advocacy, they can go to that podcast, but it's sort of part of the same kind of network. And then there's also a podcast hosted by a comedian about wrestling, which is sort of another one of Pip's interests as well as, as drug policy. Um, and the really amazing thing, we've had, I've had emails from teachers who have said that they are using this podcast in their, in their classrooms, which is, that's my dream, that's really what, why I started doing it, in the hope that it would reach teenagers, and even if it's only a few teachers, that's still fantastic for me. And incredibly gratifyingly, it was awarded the Skeptic Magazine's Occam Award this year for the best sort of skeptic podcast which was completely unexpected and amazing as well. And I've just had so many emails from people who listen with uh, advice about how I can make it better, suggestions for other things that we can talk about, that kind of thing. And I've put the Guardian logo on this as to remind me to mention that 
I also write a science blog which is hosted on the Guardian website and for the first five episodes of the podcast I wrote a companion blog piece along with the podcast. So as far as I was concerned it contained exactly the same information as was in the podcast but in written form and on a national newspaper website. The response I, get, I got to the podcast versus the blog was incredibly different which was quite surprising perhaps quite surprising anyway. So the podcast has been almost all really quite positive uh, feedback and sort of like people saying, well done for doing this, it's really great, thank you kind of thing. I don't know whether it's just because the people who choose to comment under the line on The Guardian are a certain type of person, but <laughs> particularly the, the first uh, blog I wrote, which was the, to go with the cannabis episode, wow, uh, <laughs> people really didn't like what I'd written, whereas to me it felt like I was giving the exact same information. So. I think this is something that perhaps perhaps comes onto this point about why a podcast. I think you can get a lot more nuance in a, a conversation that people can listen to, and it probably reaches a very different type of audience rather than someone who's going to sit down at a computer and read a blog. It's someone who can put this in their headphones and go for a run, or listen to it in their car while they're doing the school run, or all sorts of things. It's a bit more flexible. It also gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of the structure of the podcast that we do it at the moment we're trying we're sort of sticking to this kind of talking about the appeal and then about the effects and then about myths and that kind of thing but we have the potential to be really flexible so the bristol drugs project episode was didn't fall under that kind of category at all because it was very much about a drugs project rather than a particular substance it also means we can really be flexible about the length so some podcasts come in at around 45 minutes the psychedelics one in particular was extremely long um Whereas something like the nitrous oxide one, I think, was only about 15 or 20 minutes long. It's sort of how much information is there about the substance? How much can we sort of say? It's, it's really flexible in that way. Is it accessible? I mean, I listen to a lot of podcasts, so maybe I'm a bit biased here. But if people have a smartphone and an internet connection, then they can listen to it. Or a computer and an if they have an internet connection and something, they can listen to it. But admittedly, that's not everyone but it's a, it's a start, perhaps it's more accessible, certainly more accessible than the work I do in terms of sort of working as an academic, writing stuff in very formal way that gets published in journals where people would just never see it. This is obviously a much sort of easier method to get this information out to people. Is it audience appropriate? I hope so, um, but that's something else that I'd be really keen to hear feedback on about sort of how are we pitching it right, because I get I get emails on both sides of people saying, oh, this is way too simplistic. I really want you to go into the sort of minutiae of, of the studies that you're talking about. Um, whereas other people are saying, like, can you slow down? I'm, I'm, I'm lost. So that makes me think I'm hitting the line, but it's really, it's really hard to tell. A podcast is really convenient for Pip and I in terms of presenting it because... Uh, we meet up every few months and record sort of a batch of five or six and then I can take the recordings home and sort of chop them up and top and tail them and put them out as and when it's ready. And the other thing that's really great about, so I put them out on this app called Acast and if people listen to, to the podcast on that app rather than just downloading it from iTunes, it comes with augmented content. So all the research that I'm talking about, I put in links to further reading, links to articles, links to research, links to blog posts. And if a person's listening on that app, then as we're talking about it in their ears, the link will appear on the screen to the further information. So that's quite good for me as well, because it, there's something quite sort of nerve-wracking about doing this in that, that it's such a noisy field information about the science surrounding drugs there's so much misinformation and hype and spin and everything out there that the last thing I want to do is add to that what I'm trying to do is curate the best science and then present it with appropriate caveats but it's, it's quite a bit of work and certainly as I'm getting further away from the topics that I'm really comfortable about. So the research that I do has mainly been around cannabis, tobacco, and a little bit alcohol. And now I'm doing podcasts on all sorts of other substances. I wouldn't be able to do it without the help of uh, very generous help of um, the academic friends that I have who've been willing to look over the crib sheets that I've made and comment on them and make sure I'm not saying anything that's completely wrong or make sure I haven't missed out anything really important. 
So there's the researching, and that takes most of the time. Then there's meeting up with Pip and both of us taking sort of three hours out of our days or more for travel to actually sit down and record the podcast, and then editing them and cutting sort of... I've noticed that when I talk, I've got really bad vocal tics that I'd never noticed before until you sit and listen to yourself for hours on end, and I go, so, well, um, all the time, and then lots of those kind of really, really unpleasant noises. And when I've got my headphones in and I'm editing, I was like, chop that out. I'm really sorry for people who listen to that. So I try and, I try and edit those things out. And then Pip has a stutter. So as well, that sort of, do you cut out the stuttering or do you leave it in? I tend to leave it well alone because it's like, he's fine with it. And so we all should be fine with it. But it's, it's, it's like editing, it can take as long as you let it really. Um, and yeah, I do, every time I put out a new episode, I do slightly worry that what if this is the one where I've said something really stupid and everyone turns against me and I have to go and live in a hole and I lose my job and all of this kind of thing. <laughs> so um, that's why it's really amazing to have uh, people who are willing to sort of look over my notes at least. And also it's just been really, really interesting doing it and learning all about it and talking to people because as I said, my work mainly involves ones and zeros, but doing something like this, people really want to talk about it. So it's, it's a great conversation starter. Okay, now, now it's me asking you a favour. Um, what I'd really like to know from you guys is, do you think what I'm doing is working? Does the format work, the dynamic between me and Pip? Do you think... I don't know whether it's so important that I reach the people that I want to reach, but can it be used in the way that would be useful, I suppose, is what I'm asking. The other things that I'd really like uh, your opinion and thoughts on is, what else could we cover? So I'm certainly hoping to do an episode just talking about the concept of addiction. I've had emails from friends asking, can I do an episode about drug taking during pregnancy? Would that be something that would interesting pe interest people? Well, obviously, as we get into these things where it's more and more specialist groups, the research gets less and less as well. So that's where finding people who are expert in that topic would be incredibly helpful because that is something that I'd like to do. I'm also planning an episode about specifically about taking drugs at festivals and the specific issues that arise around that. And then the other plea is to help me find experts in, in these kind of things and other substances. And I've put my contact details here. I've also put them on this, just this thank you slide. So I'd like to say thanks to yeah, PIP, the Bristol Drugs Project, and ACAST, and then all the researchers who've been really generous with their time in helping me out. So thanks very much. <laughs>